Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fifth episode of this series on increasing visibility to unleash your Microsoft 365 potential. In this episode, we will learn how we can guard from inactive guests. I'm here today with my good friend, Drew Madelong. How are you doing, Drew? Good, Vlad. Nice to see you again. Uh, great to see you again. Uh, do you want to start with introductions? I do. So uh, this is the fifth episode, so you haven't seen this yet. But if you <laughs> this is your first one, my name is Drew Madelong, uh, Microsoft MVP and a longtime Microsoft consultant where I help organizations deploy and manage Microsoft 365, uh, usually in some larger works, larger environments. Uh, and I'm here with my partner, Crime Vlad. Uh, thanks for joining me again on this one. So, Vlad, tell, a little bit yourself. tell me a little bit about Thank you. you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Vlad Katpinescu. I'm a Microsoft MVP from Montreal, Canada, and Pluralsight author, where I create a bunch of courses on SharePoint teams and really a lot of M365 IT Pro. That's where my heart is at. Uh, and we mentioned that this is part of a series. This is actually... Well, actually, before we go into the series, bro, why don't we cover this episode? I think I got too excited. Coffee kicked yeah. in, and you know, all the slides are messing up in my head now. I'll, I'll let you drive it from now so on. Let's, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about this episode first. So this one, we're going to be going through all about inactive guests. So uh, in prior episodes, we've talked about orphaned workspaces, orphaned users. Uh, and the last episode, we talked a lot about users and inside of teams. So you're actually being an owner inside of teams. And when you're an owner inside of the teams, one of the things you can do is actually manage and work with guests. So uh, this episode, we're gonna talk about managing inactive guests and guarding against them. How do we protect that data? But first we're gonna go more into what are guest users. We're gonna then go into where and what you can do. So what can a guest user actually work with inside of your environment? What are the risks with inactive guests? And then managing those guests in M365. Now. This is episode five. So we do have other episodes around this. So I talked about, we the one we talked about before was team ownership. We do have two more coming up after this, all about oversharing. So think about, this will be a good tie into, once you understand how guests work in your environment, we're gonna talk about, great. Now, you, once you let guests in, what about oversharing, both internally and externally? And the last one in the series, we're gonna be talking all about storage and about how to manage your, your tenant environment and what that looks like. So we have a lot of stuff out there, Today, we're going to be talking all about guests. And to start, what is a guest user? Okay, so what is a guest user inside of Microsoft 365? So a key thing to think about is you might see the word guest and you might see the word external. So in Microsoft 365, those words are used in different ways. Guest user is going to be the primary way that we refer to a user that's in your directory, a user in enter ID, that is not a regular member of your organization. Right? So if I have, I could have 15 domains, that doesn't, you can have multiple domains, but technically if I'm bringing in someone else outside of my tenant, a guest is someone actually being added into my directory. So they exist, they, they are a user object. They don't, they still authenticate with their account. So if I share a file with, uh, with, with, with Vlad, Vlad logs into my environment, Vlad's still authenticating and logging in with his account, but he's logging into my directory. And there's a, a, a copy, or not really a full copy, but a, a identity inside of my Entra ID. So that's who sits there. Now there's a lot of ways that guests come, that guests happen to be in your environment, but the primary way is invitation, right? So guests at, are added into your organization through an invitation process. There's not just a, if I, if Vlad's just not automatically gonna be added. Even if I share a file, that's actually considered an invitation. If I add a user into a team, an external user into a team, that's an invitation. Now I'm adding them as guests. That's not the same as external. So I just said, if I added someone into a team, then bringing them in as a guest. You will hear the term external primarily around the term external access, which is chat federation in teams. So if I'm in the team's admin center, and I'm in, and I, as I scroll down, you'll see external access. That's going to be your chat federation. That's not going to be this scenario where I'm actually bringing guests into my directory. That is simply a, a connection between domains where I'm just talking to them through chat. So once that guest is invited, there's a redemption service that, that signs them up. And that's usually automatic. So if I, if I'm, 
I'm a user and I share that file, that person will redeem it by clicking on that link, okay? So, or by joining the team. There, that's the acceptance or the redemption of that invitation, which then puts that user object back into your organizational directory. So when I share that file with Vlad, Vlad will be added into my directory. Same, and that will happen across the different workspaces that you have. And that's how this collaboration works. And it's built around B2B. So B2B collaboration is an enter ID service called business to business, which supports this. That's the back end of external collaboration or guest user collaboration inside of Entra ID, which can expand across M365 workspaces. So it's not just SharePoint, it's not just Teams, it's not just OneDrive, it is your, your external sharing process or invitation process across all of it. Uh, Vlad, is there anything you wanna add as far as B2B Cloud? I know you and I have done sessions around this before. Uh, anything important maybe in the team's redemption process that you wanna make sure you highlight as far as like what is a guest in your in your words? Um, I, I think it's really important to, a guest is really, like you said, somebody that's not, not outside of your company that doesn't work for your organization. And something to be a bit careful with as well is, uh, I've already seen companies trying to a bit circumvent licensing uh, and having people work for the company, but then just get them a guest account with their Hotmail or things like that. Does it work technically? Yes. Should you do it? Probably not. And Microsoft is very clear with guests that there are people that do not work for your organization. And uh, while, again, I've seen organizations try to go around that definition a bit for the purpose of saving a few users here and there on licensing. Uh, make sure you check the licensing around guest users as it can have implications on your licensing cost. And that's really good because there's actually licensing cost at scale too. So if you're a larger organization and you're starting to have some very high prolific potentially transactional processes with guests, there are some licensing concerns you want to stay attention to. It's a really good call out when you think about management. And so once they're in, right? So let's say I've invited someone, there is some key information you want to know about guests in your environment. And the first thing is that when you're working with those external parties, this is the service that does it, right? So guest access is what you'll be configuring. I said that before, but it's really good to know that those services and Teams, SharePoint, and OneDrive utilize guests for sharing. Now, guests can be added to Teams, to, Share, to SharePoint sites. They can be added directly to files. So there's multiple layers that you could start to share or bring guests into your environment. And then again, they'll authenticate with their own credentials. So if they share a file with a Hotmail account, that user can still log back in as long as it's an MSA or a Microsoft account, and it can be connected to their Hotmail account, but they'll use that credentials to come back in. And then we'll actually enforce our rules against that guest authentication as they come into our tenant. And the administration is done at the enter ID level. So if I'm on it, enable sharing or guest access inside of Teams and SharePoint and OneDrive, we need to make sure we enable it at the enter ID level or the direct, which is the directory level to manage guest access for the entire tenant. And that's all using B2B collaboration. If you're gonna be working with some more specific information around, let's say shared, uh, shared channels, there is another concept called B2B direct connect, which actually allows some more levels of control. And it goes a little, it goes beyond guests. It's actually called like native identity. So that, if you're using shared channels, that's actually different. The rest of the services stay in, in B2B, uh, B2B collaboration versus B2B Direct Connect. And the last one in there, make sure, it, this is really clear when you're, it's, it's actually not, it's not clear when you're looking at the documentation, the difference between external and guest. So when you're looking up things primarily like learned at Microsoft, you don't wanna use the term external and guest synonymously. Uh, make sure you're following the right documentation when you're looking at what you can manage inside of M365. And I know Vlad, you've, you've, I'm sure you've stumbled into that one too, is trying to explain the difference between external and and guest. But is anything I missed? Maybe in Direct Connect or Collab, you want to highlight? I, I, I don't think you missed anything. But again, I just wanted to emphasize how important it is as admins to understand and use the right vocabulary between external access, which is 
federation, which has its own configurations on allowed and blocked domains with B2B, uh, which have its own, well, B2B guests, I have to say, which has its own allowed and blocked domains. And then you have the B2B direct connect, which also has its own allowed and blocked tenants because they don't manage domains. They work with tenant IDs instead of domains. So <clears throat> it's really important that, especially if you search for things on Google, things like that, you search yeah. for the right things in order to get the right results, as well as creating tickets and asking for help, things like that. And uh, I know it's so complicated, but I always joke, if it was easy, we wouldn't be paid as much, right, Drew? Absolutely. Um, but yes, we do have three different places we can configure guest access, only for Microsoft Teams, because there's more for SharePoint and other things. But only for Teams, we have three different places. And it's important as an admin to know each one of them. So this is what guest collaboration looks like. So when I'm going to be collaborating with guests, I'm going to start inside of Teams. So I'm going to look at a team which I have here, which is called I am Group. So this is a team inside of my directory uh, that I just have a single general channel in here. But I'm going to go in and say manage team. And when I go in and say manage team, you're going to see I have a section down here that says members and guests below my owners. Obviously, we're looking at the guest section here. When I go in there, I look at the two roles I have in this bottom section. So I have Bob right here, I have Magneto. And if you look at their roles, both of their roles are deemed as guests. If I go look at another team, I can look at, let's say, shared time. I think this one has some, some guests inside of it. You can expand this out. You can see I can also have people that are members and guests inside of that same team. What this means is that I've added a guest into this team. Now, if you go back and you watch one of our previous sessions of, of all around Microsoft 365 groups, you'll know that if I go into one of these groups, so I'll, let's say if I go into groups, go into all groups, and let me look at one of the teams I was looking at, which is called I am group. So we're going to look at I am group here. I come back here and I look it up. When I go into this group, you're going to see this is the same. When we're adding guests into our uh, team, I'm also adding guests into that group. So if I look at it, I have Magneto right here, which is a guest inside of this team, along with Bob who's a guest inside of this team, which in turn, I'm basically, it just means they're a guest inside of this Microsoft 365 group. Now, why that's important again, in the previous session, in the first one, we went a lot about get, uh, group management. Why that matters here is that when we're worried about guest management, we're also, we're worried about entra ID guest management because these are actually accounts in my directory. So what that means is, so I'm up here and I'm logged in as Drew. So I'm in a tenant and I have, a guest called Magneto inside of this team, that's I am group. So if I pull up this other tab here, you're gonna see this is, in this example, I'm logged in as Magneto. I have my Magneto at Timely0365 account, but I'm logged in to the Madelung tenant. Okay, so I actually had to switch tenant. So tenant switching is that concept of being able to have a single account and switching into different directories. So Timely is technically my home tenant for this account. But I'm logged in and I switched accounts to Madelung Inc. And when I do that, what I see over here on the left is I actually see the groups that I'm shared, the, the Microsoft 365 Teams or the groups that I've been added to as a guest. So I've been added to that I am group and I've been added to that, uh, I've been added to the team called Share Time. So what that means as a guest is I can come in here and I can collaborate. So I can say, hey, uh, how did you like the latest Marvel movie? Oh, I can post that as a, as a guest. So I can actually start to collaborate inside of this channel. I can come back in and I can actually work on files. I can work on different tabs in here, uh, different apps if I had. Uh, if I had different custom apps, I could actually work with these as well from a guest control standpoint. I can I can open up these files. I can say, demo me. This is a great demo. I love guest access. 
Now, what, what's important, if you look at this, I'm logged in into another tenant, right? I'm actually in that group site. I'm on, I'm accessing SharePoint, not in my directory. So I'm actually logged in, even in, in SharePoint, I, I open up a file, I log into SharePoint, I'm logged in as a guest inside of that, inside of the Drew Madeline directory. If I come back and look at Drew, I can see that I look at this channel and I see that there's been a guest in here. I can see that Magneto posted some things and I can see that he has guests next to his name. So I know that Magneto was a guest in this environment. I can obviously collaborate. Uh, I thought it wasn't great and I am getting superhero movie fatigue. Fatigue. <laughs> fatigue. And, but I'm able to get, to collaborate. I can go back in those files. I can work uh, within the files, my the same files that I've been working on that it, Magneto started. So if I, I can even put these next to each other and you can see by by having guest access enabled in a 65, I can actually collaborate together. So you'll actually see multiple people in this directory. You'll see myself, you'll see my guest account in here. So you'll see Drew and Magneto working on files together because I'm a guest in that environment. If I go back into SharePoint and I think about, so that's great. I can add and I can add a guest into Teams. Guest access is also the same thing set up when I'm sharing files. So if I'm in this team site called team site and I want to share this file with Magneto at timely 0325.com, you'll see, great. I'm going to share this outside of my organization. So what's happening is when I click OK, it says Magneto's outside of my organization. This is going to be using the B2B collaboration guest access process where I'm actually, I would be inviting Magneto into this file. And I'd be, if Magneto was not in my directory and I had external sharing on, Magneto would get a link. Magneto would have a, a link to this file. When he clicked on the file, he would then become a guest in my directory. So if I come back and I look at my my user directory here and I go type in all users and I look for Magneto, you're going to see I have Magneto right here marked as a guest in my directory, which then means he can collaborate in files, collaborate in Teams, or collaborate in other services inside of Microsoft 365. And it's really important that wherever you invite them from, whether it's from Teams or SharePoint, they all end up in Enter ID. However, you might have different settings in SharePoint than in Microsoft Teams. So it will be really important. And in the next episode, we'll talk exactly about the SharePoint settings. But I've seen so many organizations that their settings are not in sync, where they allow somebody in Enter ID, they get added for Teams. And then when they go to access a file in SharePoint, they get like the sad uh, ice cream cone because they don't have access to SharePoint. SharePoint blocks it because of a block setting there. So it'll be really important to make sure that you have the same settings everywhere to have the best user experience. And, so, and some of those pains come, or those challenges, I should say, come from the fact that those guest collaboration does go completely across these workspaces, okay? So we said that a workspace in episode one is an object that provides a place for people to collaborate, whether it's Teams, whether it's file, whether, sorry, whether it's Teams, whether it's OneDrive, whether it's SharePoint. And what matters, what you really need to think about is what you are trying to share externally will dictate where guest account access is granted. So to Vlad's point, you could have different you can have different configurations for all of these together. So if I'm sharing files in OneDrive, it could technically be different for in a single OneDrive site than sharing files in a specific SharePoint site. But there's a layer, if you think about the layers of control, we have layers of control at a file level that goes across OneDrive, SharePoint, and Teams. We have layers of control at the group level, which is adding guests inside of a per group. We have team specific sharing controls for adding people into channels, which can primarily be your shared channel. And you have the idea of sites. So I can actually bring just people into that SharePoint site. Each of these has a different guest control standpoint. Again, these are not all the workspaces, but these are the most common. So Matt, big thing to take away here is there's a different 
external sharing settings for the workspaces themselves versus the files that they're working with. So let's go through an example of what this would look like. So first, let's say I'm intern, right? So I'm, I'm Drew, and I'm going to add Vlad to a team in on my tent, on his tent. So I'm going to add Vlad. Vlad's going to click the link and join the team. In that turn, Vlad's going to become a guest in my directory. Okay, so that's, if you make a picture of what, what I did with Magneto, Vlad is becoming a guest in my directory. His guest account is then added into the group behind the tenant, the team in my tenant. So if I add Vlad to the team, he's going to be added to the group as a guest inside of my tenant, as long as external sharing is enabled for the group, for teams, and for the tenant. So it cascades down. I could then, Vlad will be granted access to the teams, the files, or whatever else is set up inside of that tenant. So let's say once he's in, well, once I've added Vlad to that team, Vlad could also now, as long as the, let's say OneDrive site allows access, someone else could add Vlad as a uh, share a file with Vlad inside of their OneDrive, because as long as external sharing is enabled, Vlad is now part of my directory. And that's a key thing with inactive guests. Once Vlad's in, he's in, okay? That's a big takeaway here. I share, I share a file, I share a team, I share add it to a group. Once they're in the directory, they're in, okay? Now, what about inactivity, right? So what is the, the onus of this session? So an inactive guest, is a guest account that does not have any login or collaboration activity in your tenant. So let's say that no one has signed in. So what you have is inactivity driven by the last sign-in date. So if no one has signed in after I shared with it, that account, that account in my directory is going to become inactive. It's very similar, if not the exact same, as having inactivity for your standard accounts inside of Microsoft 365. It also can be a guest who never signs in based on the creation date. So I could invite a guest and they may never sign in. So last sign in date might be empty, but that's okay because that we have creation dates. So I've, maybe I've added someone and since then they've never come in. They, they've never logged in once. Uh, Vlad, have you ever seen any, have you ever worked with any cost, customers or are you in part of any tenants that you might be inactive in now, right? I mean, I think in our space, we work a lot with multi-tenant setups. Uh, are you an active part? In the I'm part of quite a few tenants that I'm inactive in. I'm, I'm taking at a few conferences right now that I've been a speaker at their past conferences, but those teams are like they're deleted now. But I still see that in my tenant switcher, and I also have a few clients that I was there just temporarily on a project. Uh, I don't have access to any teams or anything, but I can still switch to that tenant. And I, I think it's a lose-lose for everybody in a way because it kind of annoys me that I'm still part of that tenant. It's just distracting. And also something that you need to remember is that when you have a guest, maybe they don't work for the company anymore, right? But if you leave their permissions, you don't know how that company handles once the user has left. Maybe... Who knows if that user maybe didn't get disabled properly and that user gets hacked. You still have standing permissions to potentially your documents through that guest user. Even if you did everything to secure your tenant, they can get in that way. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, I'm still an inactive guest in some tenants that I wish I could get kicked out of. I know I can, there's a yeah. way that I can go and I can leave and everything. And I guess I've been a bit lazy. I should probably do it, but I wouldn't mind if they kick me out of a few. And, and I think you highlight the, the key scenario there, which is you, people will remove themselves from teams, right? They'll remove access from a team, but they won't actually remove the account from the directory. So there's two layers there because you can be a guest and be part of 50 teams, a hundred teams, doesn't really matter. But, and you can remove yourself from all 100 but your account still exists. And if you stop logging in, all it takes is someone to go in and re-add you as a guest. You get the invitation and you might be like, well, I haven't logged in in six months, but let's go log in again. And that's the that's one of the risks you're looking at. So to break into an example of that, I very similar, I share a file with Vlad uh, from my OneDrive. 
You click the link, you open that file. In that scenario, you become a guest in my directory. We collaborate nicely. Of course, we always do. We finish our slides We move, and then we move it somewhere else. I move our file and I put it into our, I put it into a session that we're gonna present here and that's it. I don't share any more files with you. You don't log into my directory. So you're, you're, we could expire your access to those files. And then what can happen is you can hit a threshold, right? So let's say after a specific amount of time, say 90 days, we can, we can flag your account, right? That's what I want to see to happen is after a period of inactivity, I'm going to flag your account, not just your access, right? That's kind of where you want to move into. So how can we manage that? How can we control that threshold or control that inactivity? So if you think about it, inactive guests don't always follow that least privileged standards. And because you can mention at the workspace or guest level. So you, you need to think about both. And when you think about both, you're first gonna think about minimizing external access, right? So if you think about how I wanna, if I wanna stop inactive guests or manage inactive guests, the odds of having more inactive guests is more if you have more locations that have guest access. So there are the con controls that Vlad talked about before for like specific teams or specific OneDrives. Spend time to go figure out which ones make the most sense for your organization. Which domain blocks do we want to put in place? Do we want to do it at the group level or at the site level? By controlling that, or at least having an understanding of that before you go live with an external process, that will dictate because they dictate what you want to do for inactive guests, because some of those might be they uh, I've been in some scenarios where uh, they use they use uh, uh, yearly reporting. So as their financials are coming up to the end of the year, they're ready to report their uh, their public financials. Then they're going to bring people in externally once a year. Those are going to be different accounts. Those they're only going to log in once. So we need to treat them differently than, let's say, uh, other areas that might have guest activity. So I know it, but in that scenario, you might have a specific team, a specific group that have specific people in it. So you're actually controlling guests in a more of a, uh, a targeted way. The next thing you can do is managing guest expiration policies for SharePoint. So SharePoint has its own expiration. So let's say I shared that file with Vlad, I can actually expire the access for, for Vlad for that file after a period of time but that does not remove the guests from that directory. So very similar to what I talked about, we can expire access, but there's another level to it. But uh, make sure you expire access first, and then we can handle the activity. So you kind of meet both. And we'll talk more about some of those in oversharing, uh, in oversharing in the next session here. The big one you can do that's built into Microsoft 365 is enter ID governance. So this is a additional license that you can procure based on most likely your, your, your license is set up, uh, but this is not part of E3, where you actually, it has inactive guest logic in it. So in Enter ID Governance, it actually has inactive guest dashboards that exist so we can see based on guest activity, who's been active and who's been not, and then start to trigger a review against those. So actually being able to remove those accounts using a built-in tool inside of Enter ID Governance. The last one on here is around the third party or custom solution. So third party tools like Syskit, we'll, we'll talk about that, but there's also custom scripts that you can use. So there's a lot of data there. You can cycle through, uh, Vlad and I both use, write a lot of PowerShell. You could write a PowerShell script using maybe the, uh, most likely you wanna move to the, the graph modules now to go check your enter ID data and then perform actions against those based on some interval, it could be 30 days, 90 days, a week uh, that's up to you, but you can start to script that yourself. Uh, and I know Vlad, we're all, uh, are we? When's the expiration for the Enter ID PowerShell scripts? We got to be coming up semi soon. The, to that Azure point. AD PowerShell scripts, Azure. at least as of today, is March 2024. But let's be honest, they they've kind of delayed that date for two years now. So at, at the same time, I hope they finally like stop it. But I wouldn't be surprised if they extend it again, but we'll see. Uh, but one of the things I like about your the access reviews that you mentioned is the ability to empower your business users, your group owners to take the decision because they can be the reviewer, doesn't always have to go through IT. 
but also at the same time, having those partial scripts or the third party tools is a good way for admins to take a look at it as well. So it's not only one of those solutions, is all of them combined will help you in your quest. Only one of them will not fully help everything you need for that. And Vlad, why don't you talk a little bit about, like, you know, at this level, so you're, that's all an entry ID, right? That's at the tenant level. So what are there some other settings? What are other settings you can do at the entry ID level that kind of dictate the, the, the cascading or the hierarchy, let's say, of uh, the B2B or the guest access settings? A lot. So access reviews goes across the top, right? And then access that, like, reviews what? will cover all your Microsoft 365 groups, right? But they won't cover, for example, standalone SharePoint sites. That's not something you have. Uh, with access review. So that's something that, again, having a PowerShell script, having something else will help you if you have SharePoint or OneDrive only guests, which by the way, I think sharing in OneDrive is one of the most popular ways to share because often we share a file, a folder, and a lot of organizations put that into OneDrive. So uh, that's one of the big downsides of access reviews. And also you mentioned uh, extra licensing required. That is M3 DP2, which if you have M365 E5, you're good to go. But if you don't have it, it can be a quite a big extra cost, especially if you only get it for that reason. But yeah, looking at your slide, we have the B2B settings where access reviews and a lot of that is. You have domains there. Then you have the tenant level settings, group settings, team settings, SharePoint, OneDrive for Business, group specific. and I see you have site collections there, Drew. I've been told we're not supposed to call them site collections anymore. Right. They're yeah. simply sites. Um, I do the same thing as you do all the time. I feel like, you know, after this many years, it's tough to change habits and just call them sites, especially when they meant something else a couple of years ago. I still want to call them webs behind the scenes every once in a while. It's SP site and SP webs. It's, it's still the same thing. So, or to me. And so I think, What's interesting as you as you break this down, when you look at guest inactivity, the guest inactivity actually occurs at the service level right, or at the workspace level. And what the configurations that you're working with exist up at the enter ID level. So as you if you're enabling guest access and you and when you have a guest access on, so you have inactive guests, you think of make sure you understand that enter ID is the king, that that's on the top. All the settings that you have there will help dictate what is available inside of the tenant as you go down all the way to the site or group level itself. So you can have group settings across your environment or very group specific settings. So like this group can share with this domain, this group can't share at all. Like you, you can vary down to that as long as you say get external access is available on top. Now, as we look a little bit more into access reviews because this is a key solution as I talked about for being able to remove inactive guests from those teams and those groups. So what we can do, we can actually create an active a access review. These will be for M365 groups only. So in the example I showed before, the demo I showed before where I had Drew, I invited Magneto. I, if Magneto was inactive and I had an access review, I could trigger this and it would be able to, with that checkbox there, say, look for inactive users only for that team. I can set different inactive dates. So I could say based on a specific timeline, based on when I want to start it, I, I can actually pick different dates per each review. As Vlad mentioned, a big powerful part of this is we let the group group owners decide versus like an IT side. So my example of the users that would uh, review, let's say once a year for their public financials, this ensures that they say, yeah, I have to approve it every year, but that's okay, right? I, I'm a trust, I'm accepting that as a group owner that these public reviewers are allowed to do it once a year. We can set up multi-stage reviews. So maybe if we have uh, an owner there, we want to have an IT or a compliance team review as well. We can add those in there. And if no one replies, you can also remove access. So like if no one replies as an owner, I could remove Magneto and continue on with, uh, with my day without having to actually make any change. Now the powerhouse to this is you can soft delete the guests. Okay. So there is an option for us inside of an action review that says if when we remove them, we can also soft delete them. And that's the big difference you have. So not just removing the access in the team, I can also remove soft delete the guests, which removes them from the directory. And soft just delete just means you're able to recover them if we need to. With that, there is a ton of data, 
right? When we log in with guest access and we, if we had access reviews, whichever the case, there's so much data that you can work with as far as user activity. Almost everything is tracked. Page views, file opens, invitations sent, invitations received, uh, last accessed. All of this information is available to you as long as you're working inside of your audit logs, your enter ID sign in logs. So some of this, I've seen limitations based on how long you keep your data. So if you, you can expand onto the amount of audit log data you keep or move your ID, move your sign in data to things like Sentinel or another SIM tool or another third party solution. Because what the big thing here is there's so much data that you can work with here. This can be more defined in what you want to do. So M365 has built in access reviews, but it also has, that's really its basis, right? Normally you might jump in, what I see normally is jumping into that custom solution where we have to report on this data and we have our own process around it. And that's where something like a third party tool comes into play. So, uh, or Vlad, anything else you wanna add into as far as the amount of data or anything else you've seen with an active We got here? so much data now, it's crazy. I always joke that uh, every step you make, every breath you take, the audit log is watching you. Uh, and if you go to the Microsoft 365, or I should call now the purview audit log, you just search what a user did in the past day and you'll get thousands of actual entries. Uh, but remember, it's not kept forever. And now I, I think they, they recently changed it through as of October, where by default, instead of 90 days, it's 180 days inside purview standard. But if you have Purview Premium, you can keep it up to one year, even 10 years with certain add-ons. So uh, make sure you understand the license you have. Again, for guest and activity, doesn't really matter, right? Because if you know we keep the audit log for 180 days, you query the audit log for sign-ins, you see nothing, it means the guest didn't really sign in in 180 days. So that's a good sign. But it's important as an admin to know for how long the data is kept. And if ever you have regulatory requirements to keep it longer, make sure you either buy the add-on licenses or move it into, you mentioned a SIM tool like Microsoft Sentinel or into a third-party database storage or your own custom solution for your regulatory requirements. But Or Syskit, yeah. right? Or Syskit, Syskit does that too. So Syskit actually is able to bring that data in They'll actually be using that audit data to help support some of the solutions that you're looking for, like managing access controls or managing uh, sign-in activity. So if you don't want to go down the full SIM tool or you're not ready for that yet, there, Syskit does provide solutions like that. And they brought us here to help us support this today. And if you are interested in learning more about the capabilities around inactive guests, make sure you sign up for a 21-day 21 21 free trial over at syskit.com. It's an amazing way. Just download it and analyze your tenant, and it'll give you a really cool understanding of, well, first of all, inactive guests and many other things you might not know about your teams and SharePoint tenant. But, Drew, I think this is it for this episode. What are we talking about next, Vlad? What's on episode uh, six? Next up, I'll be talking about oversharing solution, and we'll be talking about some of the latest releases by Microsoft in SharePoint Premium the data access governance reports, as well as cover all of the different SharePoint external sharing settings that I kept talking about a bit uh, today. Uh, in the next episode, we'll go in depth and learn how we can control sharing at the SharePoint level and discover any oversharing that we might have. But that's it for this one. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching, and uh, we hope to see you in the next one. Thank you.